Hello everyone and welcome to the Hurricane Utah Adult Religion Class sponsored by the Hurricane Utah North Stake of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. My name is Mike Parker and I'm the instructor for the class. The Hurricane Utah Adult Religion Class meets on Thursday evenings between September and May to discuss the scriptures of the restored Church of Jesus Christ. If you live in or are visiting the Hurricane St. George area, I would love to have you join us. Links to the class website are available in the show notes for this video. On the website, you can download my notes, which include footnotes documenting my sources, this PowerPoint slide presentation, and handouts that I distribute in class. Please note that this YouTube channel and the class website are not official sites of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, the Hurricane Utah North Stake, or any other church unit or department. I alone am responsible for these sites and the materials on them. If you enjoy this lesson, please click the like button and share it with a friend and subscribe if you want to be notified when new content is posted on this channel. In this lesson, we're going to cover 1st Nephi chapter 8 and chapters 10 through 15. We covered chapter 9 in our last lesson. The key individuals for this lesson include Lehi, a prophet who was called to preach in Jerusalem around 597 BC, Sariah, Lehi's wife and mother of their children, Laman, Lehi and Sariah's eldest son, Lemuel, their second son, Sam, their third son, and Nephi, Lehi and Sariah's fourth and youngest son, and the author of this text. The outline of events for this lesson include chapter 8 of 1st Nephi, in which we read about Lehi's visionary dream of the Tree of Life. Chapter 10, verses 1 through 16, in which Lehi prophesied of the Jews and the Messiah. Chapter 10, verse 17, through the end of chapter 14, in which Nephi had an apocalyptic vision of the Messiah. Lehi's descendants in the Promised Land, and the coming forth of the Book of Mormon in the last days. And then finally, chapter 15, and we'll go up through the first six verses of chapter 16, in which Nephi explained Lehi's dream to Laman and Lemuel, his brothers. The setting for this lesson is the Valley of Lemuel, around 597 BC. This was a valley alongside the Red Sea in the Arabian wilderness, south of Jerusalem. Uh, we discussed this last week where this could possibly be. One particular location that holds great promise is Wadi Taib Alisim, which has firm canyon walls and a river that runs year round into the Red Sea. We're going to begin by talking about Lehi's dream of the Tree of Life. This is in chapter 8 of 1st Nephi. While the families of Lehi and Ishmael were encamped in the Valley of Lemuel, Lehi announced that he had had a revelatory dream. Lehi's dream is an example of visionary literature that transcends reality to explain spiritual things through symbols, motifs, and archetypes. It's similar to the visions seen by the prophet Ezekiel in Babylon shortly after Lehi's time. Before describing his dream, Lehi announced that because of what he saw, he rejoiced for Nephi and Sam, but he feared for Laman and Lemuel. Nephi recounted his father's dream in 1st Nephi chapter 8. With one exception, he did not interpret in this chapter the meaning of what his father saw. So we're going to simply review the dream and then we'll return to its meaning when Nephi explains it later on. So beginning with verse four of chapter eight, Lehi was in a dark and dreary wilderness in his dream where he was met by a man dressed in a white robe. This was the angel who introduced Lehi into the vision. Lehi then traveled, perhaps alone, in a dark and dreary waste for many hours, after which he prayed to the Lord for mercy. 
After Lehi prayed, he saw a large and spacious field and a tree that grew sweet white fruit that was desirable to make one happy. When Lehi ate the fruit, it filled his soul with exceedingly great joy. It was so desirable that he wanted his family to partake of it. Nephi explained in verse 20 that the large and spacious field represented the world. That's the only interpretive key he gave in chapter 8. The tree was a representation of the tree of life. The tree of life symbol appears in many other cultures throughout the ancient Near East. In Judeo-Christian scripture, it's found in the narrative account in the, of the Garden of Eden, in Ezekiel's vision of the fourth temple, and in John the Revelator's vision of the celestial city of New Jerusalem. As he cast his eyes round about, that perhaps he might discover his family also, Lehi saw a river whose head or source was in the large and spacious field and which ran along near the tree. He saw Sariah, Sam, and Nephi standing near the head of the river. He beckoned to them and they came and partook of the fruit of the tree. He also saw Laman and Lemuel near the head of the river, but they refused to come and partake. He next saw a rod of iron that extended along the bank of the river and led to the tree. He also saw a straight and narrow path that began in the large and spacious field and ran alongside the rod of iron to the tree. There was an exceedingly great mist of darkness that obscured the path to the tree. On the other side of the river, Lehi saw a great and spacious building that stood as it were in the air, high above the earth. This building was filled with all kinds of people whose manner of dress was exceedingly fine, indicating that they possessed the riches of the world. They were mocking those who had come to the tree to partake of its fruit. Within this setting, Lehi saw numberless concourses of people in the field, many of whom were pressing forward onto the path that led to the tree. These people were divided into four groups. Some started along the path, but they wandered off and were lost in the mist of darkness. Others started along the path and held on to the rod of iron that guided them through the mists until they reached the tree. After they had eaten its fruit, though, they saw the people in the building mocking them, and they were ashamed. Like those in the first group, these people fell away into forbidden paths and were lost. Many of those in the first two groups drowned in the river or were lost to Lehi's view, wandering in strange roads. Others, however, did press their way forward, continually holding fast to the rod of iron until they came forth and fell down and partook of the fruit of the tree. They ignored those in the building who mocked them. Lehi described the final group of people as pressing their way towards that great and spacious building rather than seeking to obtain the tree. Back in our second lesson, I mentioned how the Book of Mormon that we have today has feeling their way toward that great and spacious building in chapter 8, verse 31. However, that is a misreading based on Oliver Cowdery's mistake when he copied the original manuscript to the printer's manuscript. The word should be pressing. All four groups are described in this chapter as pressing their way toward something, whether it's the tree or the great and spacious building. Because of what he saw in his dream, Lehi exceedingly feared that Laman and Lemuel would be cast off from the presence of the Lord. He exhorted them with all the feelings of a tender parent and bade them to keep the commandments of the Lord. We'll discuss the meaning and interpretation of Lehi's dream when we get to 1 Nephi chapter 11. Skipping ahead to chapter 10, Lehi next prophesied to his family about the fate of the people of Judah and the coming of Christ. He first prophesied that Jerusalem would be destroyed 
the Jews would become captives in Babylon, but they would eventually return to their homeland. His prophecy came to pass. The people of Judah rebelled against Babylonian rule in 589 BC. After an 18-month siege of Jerusalem, the Babylonian army took the city in 587. They tore down the temple and the city walls and deported most of the remaining Jews to Babylon, where they remained until the Babylonians were overthrown by the Persians in 539. The Persian king Cyrus allowed displaced peoples to return to their homelands. Jumping ahead nearly 600 years, Lehi next prophesied that the Lord God would raise up a prophet, even a Messiah, or in other words, a savior of the world. This Messiah would be the redeemer of the world and the Lamb of God. Lehi prophesied that he would redeem his people from a lost and fallen state and that a prophet would prepare the way before him. Unbelieving Jews would kill the Messiah, but after he had been slain, he should rise from the dead and should make himself manifest by the Holy Ghost unto the Gentiles. Lehi didn't use the word Christ in this prophecy because that name title hadn't been revealed yet. It would be revealed to Jacob, Lehi's son, after they reached the promised land. But Lehi was clearly referring to Jesus Christ and to John the Baptist, the prophet who would prepare the way before him. This is the first prophecy of Jesus Christ in the Book of Mormon. Lehi concluded his prophecy by declaring that the house of Israel would be scattered like the branches of an olive tree that had been broken off. Part of the scattering involved Lehi's own family who were being led to a promised land. Israel, he said, would eventually receive the fullness of the gospel and come to the knowledge of the true Messiah, which Lehi compared to the grafting of branches into the olive tree. Nephi next had a visionary experience that went into greater detail concerning the prophecies his father had given. This vision is called the Apocalypse of Nephi. What is an apocalypse? The word comes from the Greek apocalypsis, a noun meaning revelation in the sense of an uncovering, an unveiling, a revealing of something that has been hidden. In apocalyptic writings, the author is taken into heaven by an angelic guide and shown amazing and often frightening visions by means of symbolism that reveal God's plans and future events. Apocalypses are found in Jewish writings at least as far back as the time of Isaiah. They were especially popular among Jews between 350 BC and AD 150. The second half of Daniel and the books of Ezekiel, Joel, Zechariah, and First Enoch are famous examples of Old Testament era apocalypses. The Dead Sea Scrolls also contain apocalyptic writings. The book of Revelation in the New Testament is an apocalypse. And in fact, Apocalypse is the name of that book in Greek. Modern scriptures also contain many apocalyptic visions. For example, Enoch and Joseph Smith both had visions in which they saw God reigning in heaven and had future events unfolded to them. Nephi's vision began with his desire to see and hear and know of the things his father had seen and prophesied about the Messiah and the mysteries of God. Nephi promised that what he saw can be seen by anyone who diligently seeketh. This promise is available in any period of time, which shows the Lord's consistency in how he acts. His course is one eternal round. By what authority did Lehi and Nephi speak their prophecies? Not by priesthood authority, which was connected to the temple in Jerusalem, for neither Lehi nor Nephi were temple priests. Rather, Nephi declared that the Holy Ghost giveth authority that I should speak these things. To demonstrate this, Nephi first related his personal encounter with the Spirit of the Lord. The Spirit of the Lord appeared to Nephi in the form of a man. This is a key doctrinal passage at the beginning of chapter 11. The Holy Ghost is not an inanimate force or essence, but a spirit being who is a son of our Heavenly Father. 
at the time of Nephi's vision, he was the same type of being as the Son, Jesus Christ, who had yet to take a mortal body. Nephi explained that his vision only took place after he had desire, belief, and spiritual preparation, after which the Spirit of the Lord took him to an exceedingly high mountain. Before the Spirit would show Nephi what he wanted to see, the Spirit gave him a test. Believest thou that thy father saw the tree of which he hath spoken? Nephi had previously received a witness of the truth of his father's revelations, so he responded, Yea, thou knowest that I believe all the words of my father. The Spirit shouted praise to the Lord, blessed Nephi for his faith, and commanded him to bear witness of the Son of God. 1 Nephi 11.8 contains the first of 13 instances in this vision when Nephi was commanded to look. The look statements divide Nephi's vision into conceptual units. The Spirit then opened the vision by showing Nephi the tree that his father Lehi had seen in his dream. Nephi asked the Spirit to tell him the interpretation thereof, or what the tree represented. The Spirit then left and was replaced by an angel who would be Nephi's guide for the remainder of the vision. The angel showed Nephi a vision of the city of Nazareth, and in the city, a virgin, most beautiful and fair above all other virgins. The angel then asked Nephi, Knowest thou the condescension of God? Not knowing the answer, Nephi wisely responded, I know that God loveth his children. Nevertheless, I do not know the meaning of all things. To condescend means to descend from the privileges of superior rank or dignity, to do some act to an inferior, which strict justice or the ordinary rule of civility do not require. Jesus Christ, who is God, condescended by choosing to come to earth and become mortal by being born of a woman. The virgin, the angel said, was the mother of God after the manner of the flesh. Now, I'm reading from the first edition of the Book of Mormon, printed in 1830. Joseph Smith made a change to this verse in the 1837 second edition. He added the Son of God after the manner of the flesh. Um, it's important to Nephi's message that it actually read the mother of God. So we're going to stick with the first edition for this particular passage. After she had been carried away in the spirit for the space of a time, Nephi saw her again, the virgin. Only this time she was bearing a child in her arms. The angel told Nephi that this child was the Lamb of God, even the Eternal Father. Again, reading from the first edition. And then returned to the subject of the tree the spirit had shown him earlier. He asked Nephi, Knowest thou the meaning of the tree which thy father saw? Nephi now understood that the tree in his father's vision represented the love of God, which is the most desirable above all things. Nephi had wanted to know the meaning of the tree in his father's dream. His angelic guide showed him Mary, the virgin who would become the mother of God himself. The angel then asked Nephi, if he now understood the meaning of the tree. The tree was a representation of Mary and therefore a metaphor for the love God showed the world by being born as a mortal. Before the Babylonian exile, the Israelites recognized a divine female who was the wife and consort of God and the embodiment of wisdom. She was represented in different forms, but most prominent was a sacred tree or tree of life. The tree wasn't just her symbol, she was the tree. The kings of Judah began to get rid of worship of this female consort just before Lehi's time, but Nephi, an Israelite living before the Babylonian captivity, would have recognized an answer to his question 
about a marvelous tree in the image of a virginal mother and her divine child. In his vision of the future, Nephi next saw the ministry and crucifixion of Christ and the persecution of Christ's apostles. The angel explained some of the symbolism in his father's dream. He told Nephi that the rod of iron represented the word of God as found in the scriptures and the teachings of the living prophets. And the head or source of the river was the fountain of living waters, which waters are a representation of the love of God manifested in the mortal ministry of Jesus Christ. Nephi next saw the condescension of God manifested in Jesus' baptism, ministry, and miraculous healings. In an ironic twist, Nephi saw that the everlasting God was judged of the world. God is supposed to judge the world, not the other way around. And he was slain for the sins of the world. Next, he was shown the multitudes of the earth who would fight against the apostles of the Lamb. He saw these multitudes in a large and spacious building, like the one in his father's dream, and was informed that the building represents the world and the wisdom thereof, and the pride of the world. Nephi was comforted by the angel's promise that this building will eventually fall, and those who fight against God will be destroyed. Switching to the Western Hemisphere, Nephi next saw and envisioned the descendants of Laman and Lemuel alongside his own descendants. They multiplied in the Promised Land and frequently went to war with one another. When Christ was crucified in the Old World, Nephi saw that many of Lehi's descendants would be killed in a cataclysm. After this, he saw Christ and the twelve Nephite disciples ministering to the descendants of Lehi, and four generations of Lehi's descendants passing away in righteousness. The angel then showed Nephi the decline and fall of his descendants because of their wars with the descendants of his brothers, Laman and Lemuel. The eventual fall of the Nephite people was connected with more symbols from Lehi's dream. Nephi saw a fountain of filthy water which was indirectly mentioned in 1 Nephi chapter 8, verse 32. It may have been a downstream portion of the river that ran by the path. We'll return to this in chapter 15. This filthy water was a representation of the depths of hell, and the mists of darkness that obscured the path to the tree were the temptations of the devil. The great and spacious building also represented the vain imaginations or worthless ideas of men. Another feature of Lehi's dream not mentioned in chapter eight was a great and terrible gulf that divided the people in the building from those who were at the tree. This was a representation of the sword of the justice of the eternal God. This is another example of an error made by Oliver Cowdery when he copied the original manuscript to the printer's manuscript. Instead of writing the sword of the justice of the eternal God, he, he wrote the word of the justice of the eternal God. Um, sword is the correct word, but our current and actually all Book of Mormon translations um, or printed editions have had word when it should be sword. Because of pride and temptations, Nephi was told that the seed of my brethren did overpower the people of my seed after which his brother's descendants did dwindle in unbelief. Returning to the old world, Nephi was next shown in his vision many nations and kingdoms among the Gentiles. Nephi saw the formation of a great and abominable church among the Gentiles. Nephi described the characteristics of this organization. It persecutes, tortures, and kills the saints of God. It seeks wealth and luxury. It is connected with harlots. In other words, it practices sexual immorality. It seeks the praise of the world. In chapter 14, Nephi used the term great and abominable church, 
to refer generally to any organization that opposes God. But in chapter 13, he was speaking of a specific religious body, an apostate church that replaced true Christianity in the first and second centuries, teaching the philosophies of men mingled with scriptures. It dethroned God in the church and replaced him with man by denying the principle of revelation and turning instead to human intellect. The angel told Nephi, behold, the wrath of God is upon the seed of thy brethren, and then showed him a man among the Gentiles who would be directed by the Spirit of God to go forth upon the many waters unto the seed of the, my brethren who were in the promised land. After this, many more Gentiles came, and the seed of my brethren were scattered before the Gentiles and were smitten. The man among the Gentiles, upon whom the Spirit of God came down and wrought upon, has been generally understood by Latter-day Saints to be Christopher Columbus, although there is no revelation or direct statement from church leaders that has formally endorsed this interpretation. In Nephi's description of the vision, the account of the first Gentiles coming to the New World is both preceded and followed by a declaration that the wrath of God was upon the descendants of Laman and Lemuel in the Promised Land. That is certainly true. Within 200 years of the coming of Christopher Columbus and the first Spanish explorers, the Native American populations of Mexico, Central America, and South America had declined by more than 80% due to exposure to European diseases, and millions of indigenous peoples had been killed in warfare or enslaved. Based on this, it seems to me that the man among the Gentiles who was wrought upon by the Spirit of God could be understood as an instrument of God's wrath, similar to how the Lord called the Assyrians the rod of mine anger because they were sent to punish the wicked people of Judah. After this, Nephi saw in vision the Gentiles who would be brought by the Spirit to the land of promise and that they did prosper and obtain the land for their inheritance. Because they humbled themselves before the Lord, the power of the Lord was with them, and they were delivered by the power of God out of the hands of all other nations. This passage is understood by many Latter-day Saints as a reference solely to the American colonies and the American Revolution of 1775 to 1783, the chronology in the wider passage, chapter 13, verses 10 through 37, may indicate, however, that it's more inclusive of the entire Western Hemisphere. Nephi tells us that the Gentiles would come to the Promised Land, after which Native American peoples, the seed of Nephi's brethren, would be scattered by the Gentiles and smitten. This scattering would take place before the Gentiles did prosper and obtain the land for their inheritance, before their mother Gentiles had gathered together to battle against them, and before the gospel was restored and the Book of Mormon came forth. The American War of Independence, 1775 to 1783, and the restoration of the gospel, spring of 1820 through April 1830, both took place before the United States forcibly removed Native American tribes, starting with the Indian Removal Act that was signed into law in late May 1830 by U.S. President Andrew Jackson. 1 Nephi 22 verses 7 and 8 also follow the same chronology. The Lord God will raise up a mighty nation among the Gentiles, yea, even upon the face of this land, and by them shall our seed be scattered. And after our seed is scattered, the Lord God will proceed to do a marvelous work among the Gentiles. The scattering and smiting of the descendants of the Lamanites must therefore refer to events that took place before the American colonial period. My interpretation is that the prophecy in verses 13 and 34 of chapter 13 refers to the genocide of indigenous peoples conducted by the Spanish starting around the 16th century. And the war prophecy in verses 17 through 19 includes wars of independence fought across North and South America in the 18th and 19th centuries. 
Nephi also saw a book, the Bible, carried forth among the Gentiles. The book in his vision contains the covenants of the Lord, which the Lord hath made unto the house of Israel, and it also containeth many of the prophecies of the holy prophets. He also learned that the great and abominable church had taken away from the gospel of the Lamb many parts of the book, which are plain and most precious, and also many covenants of the Lord have they taken away. And because these things have been removed, an exceedingly great many do stumble. The angel promised Nephi that the Lord would not allow the Gentiles to destroy Lehi's descendants, nor would he allow the Gentiles to forever remain in that state of awful wickedness brought about by the loss of plain and precious parts of the Bible. The Lord promised to be merciful to the Gentiles by bringing forth unto them in mine own power much of my gospel. This would be accomplished by bringing forth other books that would validate, vindicate, and support one another. One of these books would be the Book of Mormon, the record of the Nephites. The angel told Nephi that if the Gentiles shall hearken unto the Lamb of God and harden not their hearts, they will be numbered among the house of Israel. The Lord promised that he would work a great and marvelous work among the children of men that would bring them either peace and life eternal or spiritual destruction. The Lord's marvelous work in the last days is a subject that Nephi will come back to later in his record. We'll discuss it in greater detail in future lessons. God's wrath would come upon the great and abominable church. In chapter 14, the term great and abominable church is used as a type to describe all organizations and groups that fight against the Lamb of God. Anyone who worships wickedness, immorality, or evil belongs to that metaphorical church. The angel promised Nephi that these evil organizations would not succeed. That great pit, which hath been digged for the destruction of those who did not harden their hearts against the Lamb of God, shall be filled by the bodies of those who digged it unto their utter destruction. In Nephi's vision, the great and bondable church is referred to as a whore, a prostitute who sells sexual services. After the marvelous work had gone forth, Nephi saw those who followed the Lord. 1 Nephi chapter 14, verses 11 and 12. And it came to pass that I looked and beheld the whore of all the earth, and she sat upon many waters, and she had dominion over all the earth, among all nations, kindreds, tongues, and people. And it came to pass that I beheld the church of the Lamb of God, and its numbers were few because of the wickedness and abominations of the whore who sat upon many waters. Nevertheless, I beheld the church of the Lamb, who were the saints of God, were also upon all the face of the earth, and their dominions upon the face of the earth were small because of the wickedness of the great whore whom I saw. Nephi saw those who belonged to the church of the Lamb of God in the last days, and that they would be found upon all the face of the earth, but they would be few in number because of the monstrous influence of evil in the world. In 2010, President Boyd K. Packer taught, quote, it has been over 180 years since the priesthood was restored. We now number nearly 14 million members. Even so, we are a tiny fraction when compared to the billions of people on earth, but we are who we are, and we know what we know, and we are to go forth and preach the gospel. The Book of Mormon makes it clear that we will never dominate by numbers, but we have the power of the priesthood." Unquote. Nephi's vision and President Packer's words warn us that we should not expect the growth of church membership to continue to increase at the rapid pace we have seen in recent decades. As the world becomes more secular and more wicked, we should not be surprised if the numbers of new converts each year continue to decline and the total membership of the Lord's Church remains small when compared to the total population of the earth. 
The spectacular growth we've seen in the number of members of the church has been a welcome blessing, but it is not evidence of the truth of the gospel. The final scene from Nephi's apocalyptic vision included the wrath of God poured out upon that great and abominable church, and the promise that at that day, meaning the last days, the work of the Father shall commence in preparing the way for the fulfilling of his covenants, which he hath made to his people, who are of the house of Israel. The record of Nephi's vision ended with a vision of John, an apostle of the Lord, who would write the remainder of what he and Nephi both saw. This record is found in the book of Revelation in the New Testament. Nephi was forbidden to write anything more of the things that he saw or heard. In chapter 15, Nephi explained his father's dream to his brothers Laman and Lemuel. Nephi returned from his vision to his father's tent, where he found his older brothers arguing about the meaning of their father's dream, because the things in it were hard to be understood, save a man should inquire of the Lord. Nephi asked them if they had inquired of the Lord. They replied that they hadn't. Nephi chastised them for not keeping the commandments and admonished them to ask the Lord in faith. Nephi explained the meaning of Lehi's dream to his brothers. He told them that the house of Israel was like an olive tree, and Lehi's family was a branch of that tree that had been broken off. The scattered Jews would one day be grafted back into the tree or restored to the fold of God. He then explained specific images from Lehi's dream. The tree is the tree of life. The iron rod is the word of God. And whoso would hearken unto the word of God and would hold fast unto it, they would never perish. According to Nephi, his father was so distracted by other things that he didn't notice that the river was filthy and represented filthiness, perhaps sin. The awful gulf which separated the wicked from the tree of life and also from the saints or holy ones of God is a representation of that awful hell prepared for the wicked. The gulf represents both torment in this life because of sin and also eternal damnation after the great and final judgment. It also represents the separation that must exist between the righteous and the unrighteous in eternity because there cannot any unclean thing enter into the kingdom of God. The devil is the proprietor of hell, and the wicked are separated from the righteous and from the tree of life, whose fruit is the greatest of all the gifts of God. The greatest of all of God's gifts is eternal life, so the fruit represents eternal life. After Nephi finished explaining the meaning of his father's vision to Laman and Lemuel, his brothers complained, Thou hast declared unto us hard things, more than we are able to bear. Nephi's response was direct. The guilty taketh the truth to be hard, for it cutteth them to the very center. Nephi pleaded with his brothers to keep the Lord's commandments, and they humbled themselves to such a degree that Nephi had great hopes that he would see a permanent change in them. That's it for this lesson. If you enjoyed it, please click the thumbs up button to give it a like and leave a comment below. Please subscribe if you'd like to be notified when new lessons are posted to this channel and visit www.huarc.org to download the notes and slideshow for this lesson. In our next lesson, we'll discuss the journey of Lehi's group to Bountiful, the building of a ship, their voyage to the Promised Land, and Nephi's first use of the writings of Isaiah to teach about the Messiah. The reading for this lesson is 1 Nephi, chapters 16 through 22. See you next time.